Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Our message today is... Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Amen. Listen to our first lesson for today from Genesis chapter 45. These words from the, the end of the story, really, of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. And he kissed his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> Dear Christian friends who are forgiven by God's extreme grace, I'm very grateful for the wonderful relationships that I have in my family, in my, my immediate family especially. I grew up very close to my brothers and sisters and I still stay close to them and, and really enjoy their company whenever we can get together. But as I've gotten older, I've learned more about myself and I've also become more aware of how increasingly different I am from my siblings and other people in my family, especially now that we don't live under the same roof or, for most of us, even in the same state. Then in-laws enter into the picture and they bring their own wonderful personalities and the family changes just a little bit. And as I've gotten to know more people, your families, other families that I've met, I'm increasingly grateful as I see that a whole family that gets along with each other is a very rare and wonderful blessing indeed. Getting along with absolutely everyone, including our family, is practically unheard of. We, we all have different priorities. We all have different values different things that we think are important, different strengths and weaknesses, and let's face it, even in our families, even in our Christian families, we're still sinners who sin against one another and hurt each other all the time. And those sins cause wounds, deep, hurtful scars that damage our relationships inside of our families and outside of them, and if left untreated, those wounds can absolutely tear families apart. And they have. Without the grace that God gives through his forgiveness, those wounds of sin can even destroy faith and take away our hope of eternal life, of, his, of salvation in heaven with Jesus. Don't be afraid, though, God tells us today. He says that the secret to healing those wounds of sin is in real love. The secret is real love, the love and forgiveness that only he can give us. And he does give us graciously and abundantly. Now Joseph and his brothers, <coughs> before this section of scripture that we're reading for this morning, they've been through a whole lot together. They, there were some sinful wounds in their family that you might expect no amount of grace, no amount of forgiveness, no amount of love could ever smooth over. Let's just remember what they've been through to get them to this point. Joseph was one of the youngest of Jacob's 13 children, but he was the oldest son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. 
And there's a whole fascinating story about how Jacob's family grew to 12 sons and one daughter. And you can read it. Just open your Bible sometime this afternoon to Genesis chapters 29 and 30 and, and, and read how all of that happened. But because Joseph was daddy's favorite, his brothers hated him. They became incredibly jealous of them. And Jacob, daddy, seems to be unaware, naive, or maybe uncaring about the fact that this bad blood was brewing between his sons, and he gives Joseph this beautiful coat. We don't know exactly what it looked like. Maybe you've heard of Joseph's coat of many colors, um, but it does seem appear that it was a coat that an overseer would wear, indicating that Joseph was the most important, the overseer of his brothers, and they were just the local farmhands that his dad used to, to do the work around the place. Of course, that made Joseph's brothers even madder at him. And Joseph, like his dad, Jacob, seems to be unaware that his brothers, are, you know, unaware of the danger that his brothers really, really hate him. And he has these dreams, dreams of uh, being out in the field and his brother's sheaves of grain bow down to his sheaf of grain. And another dream that the sun, moon, and 11 stars are bowing down to him. And he goes and he tells his brother, brothers and even his dad about this dream, indicating that he thinks they mean something for the future, that there's meaning to these dreams, and the brothers are so angry with him, the Bible actually says they could not say a kind word to him, to their own brother. They couldn't say anything nice. Ironically, all of these things that happened, Joseph giving, being given an overseer's coat, the visions of his family bowing down to him, these things did actually come true, didn't they? And they're coming true in Genesis chapter 45 that we're reading for today. When Joseph's brothers come to him and he's prime minister of Egypt, they bow down to him as their king. All of the brothers, though, were so angry with Joseph for the boasting and the favoritism that when Jacob sent his youngest son to go out into the fields and to check on his brothers who were working tending the sheep, this is what they said about their brother. Oh, look, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and then say that a ferocious animal has devoured him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Let's just pause for a moment and recognize that this is God's chosen family. The one that he has picked out of all the nations in the world, out of all the tribes, all the families in the world, to be his chosen people. This is Jacob and his 12 sons, the ones from whom the Israelites got their 12 tribes of Israel. And look at how they treat each other. It reminds us that it was not because they were so pure, so righteous, so loving, so godlike, or in any way special, that God chose them to be his particular people and to carry on the promise of the Savior of the world. It was purely because of God's grace. So remember that when you have struggles in your family, when the kids seem to be squabbling and not getting along, when you have disagreements with brothers or sisters, aunts or uncles, parents or grandparents. That just because maybe others aren't treating you kindly doesn't mean that you're excluded from God's grace. Doesn't mean that God can't use you and your family to bring wonderful blessings into this world and it doesn't mean that he has stopped blessing you either. He can still use you and your family to bring about his blessed purposes and to fill your lives with wonderful blessings as well. Well, these brothers of Joseph decided that they weren't going to kill him. They were going to sell him as a slave and make some money off of him. He was their flesh and blood brother after all. But they still told their father, Jacob, the lie that he was killed by a wild animal. Do you think that any amount of love and forgiveness could heal these wounds in their family? They really just seem so deep, so hurtful. 
As we read Jesus' words in our gospel lesson, telling us to love our enemies, as we hear Paul's words of warning in our second lesson for today, that we are not to take revenge against our enemies, you might be wondering, now, who is my enemy? Let's marvel at that, too. We live in such a peaceful time and place that we may not have this long list of enemies. Anything maybe even stronger than a a short list of people that we don't get along with very well. I mean, if we're honest, our political, our national enemies are so far removed from us that we may not ever even interact with them personally. We may never speak with them or even see them. Thank God he has blessed us so greatly to live in a time where we have to think about who our enemies are are. But this account from the life of Joseph reminds us that often our deepest hurts, often our deepest wounds come from the people who are very closest to us, the people in our own families, siblings, aunts and uncles, in-laws, perhaps even our spouse. Those wounds, those sins, those jabs from one sinner to another can make family get-togethers like Thanksgiving or Christmas or anniversaries or birthdays so awkward and even painful. They can make us despise our families or even want to hurt them. These are the people that we should love most of all, the ones that God commands us to, to love and care for all throughout our lives and the ones who should be for us our, our strongest support The breakdown of the family, that family love and support, is a plague that is infecting our entire nation and our communities. It sends people into depression, causes other serious health problems. There's a whole division in the counseling field just to deal with family strife. And I hope that if you are in a situation where strife is building or you're struggling to deal with it in your family, that you would seek a family counselor, or come talk to me as your pastor, and we can get you hooked up with resources that will help you to get out of those problems. Those wounds, if they are left untreated, they can break apart marriages and cause families to completely crumble. There's a reason why the phrase family feud was so well known, so common, that it became a big hit game show. These deep and hurtful wounds of sin need the forgiveness that only Jesus can give. He starts the chain of forgiveness by first of all showing us, promising us, assuring us, even through his body and blood in the sacrament, that our sins, our many sins, are already forgiven. He tells us, as we read or sang in our psalm for today, that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And I think the picture there is beautiful. He specifically uses east and west. Did you know if you go north and head in a straight line, at at some point you're no longer going north. You're turning around and heading south again. There's an end point to north and an end point to south. But if you would take those same sins and head east or head west. You never end up going the opposite direction. They're they're infinitely far apart. And so God shows us and reminds us with that picture that he has taken our sins completely away from us. He removed our sins from us by sending Jesus, born as a baby in Bethlehem, living a perfect life for us in our place, to suffer and die the punishment that we deserve for our sins on the cross. He paid the penalty that we owed. He showed us the full extent of his love and forgiveness by dying to save us, the Bible says specifically, when we were still his enemies. Jesus prayed as they nailed his hands and feet to the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But it wasn't just the soldiers there who were acting against Jesus that he was loving. It was you and me too. 
for all of the actions, all of the thoughts, all of the words that we have spoken that go against God and his dominion over us. Now God urges us in light of the love and forgiveness that he has placed in our hearts, in light of the load of sin that he has taken off of our shoulders, that we ought to follow his example and love and forgive even our enemies. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ, in the same way that in Christ God forgave you. In Joseph's story, we jump ahead about 15 years from where he was sold into slavery. Now Joseph is the prime minister of the Egyptian empire, right-hand man to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And if you don't remember how he got there, I'd encourage you once again to open your Bibles and read Genesis chapters 39 through 41. It won't take you long to get through it. Probably a lot of it is familiar to you. But suffice it to say here in our worship service that Joseph went through a lot a lot of suffering, a lot of unjust things happened to him in that time, in that space of time that he could have been very angry about. But he comes out the other side, prince of Egypt, and doing something wonderful to help people. Obviously, God was training him and blessing him so that in the end, Joseph could plainly see, and we can see too, looking at what happened to him, that God had worked all of this out while he was suffering. God was blessing him and making plans for him that he could never have foreseen. And so he said to his brothers in our reading, God sent me ahead of you. It wasn't you that sent me, he said. Can you imagine him turning that around and twisting that? Of course they sent him. They were the ones who took the money, the 20 pieces of silver for selling him into slavery. They sent him down there. They put him in that caravan. He says, no, you didn't. God sent me here. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Rather than gripe about what his brothers had done to him, how unfairly they had treated him, all the suffering and pain that he went through, all the injustice, Potiphar's wife lying about him, being left to rot in jail by the cupbearer and the baker. Instead of that, he praised God for what God was accomplishing and had accomplished in him and through him. Now I'm sure Joseph had days where he was sitting there in jail when he didn't feel as positive and as generous about everything that was happening to him, but God saw him through. And by faith, Joseph's eyes were open to see and understand the wonderful blessings that God was bringing about even through his unjust suffering. God had been good to him, and God was bringing about good through him. And Joseph could see that despite his own personal sins, he was well aware that he was a sinful person. God had never forsaken him. God knew, he knew that God was loving and forgiving and that he was a direct recipient of God's grace and blessings. So he praised God even after all that he had suffered and endured at the hands of his brothers and he was willing to continue to love and forgive. Because God has poured out his love and forgiveness on us, we will also be loving and forgiving to others, even others who mistreat us. We will follow Christ's example and forgive those who sin against us, just as in Christ God forgave you. And isn't that really the greatest joy? to not only tell someone but show with your example what it means that Christ forgave you. When someone sins against us, when we suffer unjustly, when even our family members, even our spouse is unkind and lo unloving to us, we have a wonderful opportunity to share with them the most blessed news and to act it out in the way that we treat them. I forgive you just as Christ forgave me. And if that is our greatest joy, as it should be as Christians, to share that wonderful news with others, then when others sin against us, it should not make us angry or want to take revenge, 
but it should fill us with praise for God that I can show you the forgiveness. Look, you're giving me a, a, a concrete example, a concrete opportunity to show God's love and forgiveness to you. I can show you what forgiveness really means. Now, I'm not saying that Christians should let people just absolutely walk all over them and, and put them down without defending themselves, but when we understand the truth that when people sin against us, they are really demonstrating a deadly weakness. And forgiveness in Christ is the powerful antidote. We will rejoice to share it with them. Yes, even our families, even our enemies. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Stoddard. Join us for worship at the following times. Like us on Facebook or visit our website for audio and video sermons or to find out more about our congregation. God bless your week in the Lord.